I will be reading Numbers chapter 20, verses 1 through 13. I want us to consider the subject of using the right metrics to define success. This is our third sermon on this mini-series on, on defining success, the, the, uh, <clears throat> the two years that we were under captivity. Uh, in 2020 and 2021 gave us a lot of uh, uh, opportunity to think about life and, and so on and to redefine things. And I think revisiting how we think of success is important for us. And so today I want us to make sure that we're using the right metrics to measure success instead of the world's metrics. In Numbers 20, we are approaching the end of the wilderness uh, period. Uh, the the, the uh, Israelites are back to Kadesh for the second time. Remember that's from here that the spies were sent into uh, the promised land. And uh, we, we have this episode in Moses' and Israel's life that uh, will keep Moses from going into the promised land. So Numbers chapter 20. I'm going to start reading at verse 1, and I'm reading today from the English Standard Version. And the people of Israel, the whole congregation, came into the wilderness of Zin in the first month, and the people stayed in Kadesh. And Miriam died there and was buried there. Now there was no water for the congregation, and they assembled themselves together against Moses and against Aaron. And the people quarreled with Moses and said, Would that we had perished when our brothers perished before the Lord? Why have you brought the assembly of the Lord into this wilderness, that we should die here, both we and our cattle? And why have you made us come up out of Egypt to bring us to this evil place? It is no place for grain or figs or vines or pomegranates, and there is no water to drink. Then Moses and Aaron went from the presence of the assembly to the entrance of the tent of meeting and fell on their faces. And the glory of the Lord appeared to them. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Take the staff and assemble the congregation, you and Aaron, your brother, and tell the rock before their eyes to yield its water. So you shall bring water out of the rock for them and give drink to the congregation and their cattle. And Moses took the staff from before the Lord as he commanded him. Then Moses and Aaron gathered at the assembly together before the rock, and he said to them, Hear now, you rebels, shall we bring water for you out of this rock? And Moses lifted up his hand and struck the rock with his staff twice, and water came out abundantly, and the congregation drank and their livestock. And the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, because you did not believe in me to uphold me as a holy in the eyes of the people of Israel, therefore you shall not bring this assembly into the land that I have given them. These are the waters of Meribah, where the people of Israel quarreled with the Lord, and through them he showed himself holy. This is the word of our Lord. As I... As I read this as I, re I was reading through this more things are coming to my mind and how this really reflect pastoral ministry so this is the bonus part of chapel not yet what we're going to be talking about uh, if you're a pastor if you're planning to be a pastor you're going to be doing what Moses and Aaron did a lot that is being on your face before the Lord because the people the Lord has entrusted, entrusted to you to serve but as we think of success, as we think of measuring success rightly, we have to realize that unbiblical ways of measuring success often creep into our lives. Metrics such as the balance of our financial portfolio, the size of our church, the number of followers we have on social media, how fit we are. Uh, that's not a standard that I follow, as you can tell. Uh, uh, athleticism, how well our kids are doing, and a myriad of other achievements creep in, and we use those as measurements of success. We look at these categories in order to determine whether we're successful or not, yet 
are these the same standards that God uses to measure success in the life of his people? I want us to see today that success has very little to do with any of these categories. These, these are worldly ways of thinking of success. These, these metrics are not what God gives us to, to measure success. So far we've seen that success is being loved by God and loving Him. We saw that from John chapter 1, uh, John chapter 21 in the interaction of Peter and Jesus. We also saw that success is believing that God exists and that He is the rewarder of those who diligently seek Him in Hebrews chapter 11 verse 6. Today I want to introduce a third metric as we work at defining success biblically. This third metric is faithfulness. Faithfulness to God as He reveals Himself to us in the Scriptures. Now we all know that the Shorter Catechism teaches the, uh, that the ultimate measure of success is to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. Everywhere that, that uh, question is quoted, I uh, was at, uh, uh, together for the Gospel Conference last week, and no matter what flavor the speaker was, I think every single speaker referred to question number one of the Shorter Catechism, and we, that's great. We say amen to that. And so, ultimate success is to enjoy and to glorify God in this life and the life to come. That's question number one. The next two questions of the Shorter Catechism are not as well known to us. I, I even considered asking our students to stand and recite them uh, from memory uh, right now, but I'm not going to uh, do that. Uh, they, are, they are not as well known to us, yet they are very important as we think about success because they outline how we can achieve the ultimate success of enjoying God and, to, and glorifying God. Does anybody know what questions 2 and 3 of the Shorter Catechism asks? About the Word of God. Right, that's what they're about. So we, at least we have a, a summary of what is. Question number 2 asks... What rule has God given to direct us how we may glorify and enjoy Him? To which it answers, The Word of God which is contained in the Scriptures of the Old and New Testament is the only rule to direct us how we may glorify and enjoy Him forever. By the way, Westminster Standards is being offered next semester. And if you're taking it, you will have to memorize the shorter uh, catechism. <clears throat> So, to enjoy and glorify God, we must know the Scriptures. Guess what the Scriptures teach us? I'll do that. Question number three asks a second, adds a second element to this idea. The question asks, what do the Scriptures principally teach? That is, what are the Scriptures about? What's the main point of the Scriptures? And the answer is, do the Scriptures principally teach what man is to believe concerning God? And what God requires of us. That's really what the Bible is all about. Who God is and what He requires of us. And that's really the purpose of the Scriptures. To teach us what we should believe and what we should do. That being the case, in order to enjoy and glorify God, we need to know and obey the Scriptures. These are the two elements of faithfulness. Know and obey the Scriptures. So success is not found in seeking to be successful by some worldly metric. Success is found, is achieved by being faithful to God through the Word. Now we look at the Numbers 20, and uh, uh, if you look at the first 11 verses, you have this idea that perhaps Moses was very successful in this particular episode. We find Israel nearing the end of the wilderness years. Uh, they find themselves thirsty, and they start hurling Bitter accusations at Moses. We see that in verses 3 and 4. Moses and Aaron seek uh, the Lord in their discouragement, and the Lord hears them in verses 5 through 9. Moses comes out of the tabernacle, gathers the people. He's tired of the complaining. Forty years of sheep biting your legs and not wanting to go where uh, you want them to go, or the, where the Lord is uh, sending them almost 40 years of hearing the people grumbling about the most insignificant things was wearing 
him down. Time and again, he provided for them, and all they give him in return is more complaining. And you know that people have changed tremendously since Moses' time. They don't do that anymore, right? You, people in church don't complain anymore. <laughs> they don't bite the shepherd anymore. No, this is, this is things that you face in the church today. He looks over them. So you can picture them gathered at Kadesh. He looks over them, and his blood finally boils. You see that in verses 10 and 11. He hits the rock twice, and water gushes out. And, 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 and picture this. This is not a small amount of water. It's enough water to, 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 to quench the thirst of two million plus people plus their cattle, their livestock. So it's a lot of water come, coming there. The people are satisfied. They have water. Everybody's thirst is quenched. People are happy. Moses is vindicated. Once again, he successfully provided for the people of God, despite all their grumbling, despite all their unthankfulness, Moses has provided, as far as we can tell, that was a highly successful day. And then verse 12 comes in. From heaven's perspective, it was a failure of a day. Moses was not faithful to the word of God. He struck the rock when God told him to just do what? Just to speak. To the rock, and you can you can come up perhaps with all kind of Christological um, emphasis or implications. Uh, First Corinthians tells us that that rock was uh, was Christ, and that rock had already been struck by Moses once earlier on in the beginning of the wilderness years. And whatever we're not going to go there, but whatever reason Moses was supposed to speak to the rock, but he didn't. He struck the rock not only once, but twice. And as a result of that, Moses was not going to be able to lead the people in the pro into the promised land. Moses had given, had given to the people exactly what they needed, water. And yet, he was not successful in that. And we, we look at this passage and think, boy, that seemed a little, and a little bit of an overreaction on God's part. Man, come on, man. The guy was under a lot of pressure. He served faithfully for almost 40 years. And now because he struck the rock, instead of just talking, you're not going to let him go into the promised land. And he did almost everything that God asked him to do. It was like 98% there. And if that thought kind of comes into our minds, that's, that this thought betrays then our own lack of understanding of what success is. Success is treasuring what God says and then doing exactly what he commends. Uh, somebody said once, the God is not a God of detail. Which always gets to me, has he, does, uh, do they read the Old Testament? I mean, do you read like, uh, I don't know, Genesis 6 through 9 with the infinitesimal details on building the ark to the, to the, point of saying this is where you put pitch and what kind of pitch and how many strokes and then the building of the tabernacle with how many little uh, things you're going to hang your curtains on and and repeated four times because there's four time four sides to the tabernacle God is a God of detail and detail matters to him and he wants us to pay attention and obey him precisely now the Puritans I know the word Puritan was a pejorative term their enemies called them Puritans they prefer, they prefer being called precisionists. Now, if they're going to get a label themselves, they're precisionists because they, were, they wanted to be precise about obeying the Word of God, not in a Pharisaic way, but in a faithful way as God demands. That's why we try to the best of our ability to let the Bible shape everything we do at our churches so we can be obedient to the Lord. So success is faithfulness, faithfulness to the Word of God. Paul ends 2 Corinthians chapter 4, or begins 1 Corinthians chapter 4 by saying, this is how one should regard us as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required of stewards that they be found faithful. If you're going to be a minister, if you're a minister of the gospel, you are a steward. God's talked about, uh, uh, 
Later on, Paul talks about our having the gospel in earthen vessels or jars of clay that we're supposed to steward, and stewards are defined as being faithful. And I want, us to, I want to divide the concept of faithfulness into two factors. Obedience is one, part of being faithful, obedience to the Word of God, but also hard work. And I think a lot of times pastors will struggle with the idea of, of working hard, it's, it, it, especially newer pastors. I was uh, reading not too long ago the uh, stories uh, coming from another seminary in the East Coast where the professors were really encouraged the students not to work more than 35 hours a week. That's like Wednesday. What are you going to do the rest of the week? You know? Uh, uh, the hard work is part of being faithful in the ministry. So, the Bible consistently links success to obedience. Okay? And so faithfulness is displayed in obedience, which is a measurement of success. After Moses' death, Joshua takes over, and God reiterates this truth to, to, to him. He says, remember what the message that uh, we always remember, the be strong and courageous, right? That's what God tells Joshua. But that's not the entire of the message. He says that he is to, do, to be careful to do everything according to the law of Moses. And that's what's going to cause him to be Courageous. Interesting that he's going to be a military leader. He's going to lead the troops of Israel, the host of Israel, into the promised land. He's going to know, have to know to do, how to do a bunch of things. And God says, no, the thing that you really need to do as a general of God's army, do everything the Bible says. That's it. That's what, that's what the Bible they had, right? The five bo books of Moses. You do that. And you see that in the history of Israel too. David, that's the words in Second Kings in 1 Kings chapter 2, those are the words he gives to Solomon, the advice. He gives Solomon, look, I messed up, I did a lot of wrong things, but you, you cannot go wrong by just paying attention to what the Bible says, what the law of Moses says. Be faithful to the Word of God. So obedience to the Word of God is success in God's book. And if obedience to the Word of God is the key to faithfulness and success, then knowing the Word of God is key to obedience. Knowing the Bible is key to obedience. It's interesting that in my 20 plus years in the presbytery, the, the, the area where people have the hardest struggle, the hardest time in our licensure exam is knowledge of the Bible. You know, Calvin this, Luther that, Hodge this. How about Paul and Christ and Moses? So to be successful, we need to do, know the scriptures, to be obedient, you need to know uh, the scriptures. So if we are ever to know true success, we must soak ourselves in what the scriptures say and call us to do. The question then that those of us who desire to succeed in God's service must, that we must answer is this. Do we know God's word and are we growing in our knowledge of it? The knowledge of the Bible begins and is fed by reading it and by hearing it preached. So every follower of Jesus Christ must be endeavoring to read the Bible daily. And you might say, well, it's, is there, I don't see that command in the Bible. Well, sure, I cannot tell you, go to this chapter. But read Psalm 119. Do you, what, what's the, what's the, what, the idea did you come out of it? That David sporadically meditates upon the Word of God, that David sporadically memorizes the Word of God. No, he says that he has hidden the Word of God in his heart, that he might not sin against God, that he meditates daily on that Word, that he prays that the Lord will daily open his eyes and might see wonderful things concerning God in his, in his law. So, I know that's, uh, that's a weird question to ask a seminary crowd, but have you read your Bible through? Have you read your Bible through? We need more Bible. We don't need a minute devotions. Uh, the, the, when I was in seminary, uh, it seems like every year we get free devotional Bibles. Then I don't remember that, Chris. There was a minute Bible where you know, they had readings that you could do in a minute. That's all you had to have. A devotion was a minute. No, we need more by more bigger chunks of the Bible. The scriptures are our spirit are to our spiritual life. 
what air is to our physical life. If we're not breathing in the scriptures, we're not going to live obedient lives. Now, many of God's most used servants have read the Bible through and meditated upon them several, several times in their lives. Every day they do that. You've heard of George Mueller of orphanage fame and prayer fame. It's said by his biographer that in his lifetime he read the Bible through 200 times. That's a lot of Bible reading. Uh, there's a time in David Livingston's life. Remember how David Livingston went to Africa was a missionary slash National Geographic kind of guy and he's going through through Africa and I think he's going east to west and he gets trapped in the city in the town and he can't move for about two months and those two months he said you know what since I can't move forward I'm just going to read my Bible in those two months he read the Bible four times because that's what he needed to be a minister of God now these men believed what Spurgeon later said that a Bible which is falling apart usually belongs to someone who is not right so, as a believer in Jesus Christ, the call from both the scriptures and the lives of faithful men is for us to be people of the book. Sure, use Twitter. Read, do whatever you do on Instagram. I don't have Instagram, so I'm not sure what people do on Instagram. Uh, have fun doing those things, but be in the Bible. Be in the Bible. The call in our lives is to know the Bible and to interpret it correctly. If you're not, if you're not currently engaged in the systematic study of the Bible, commit to it today. Don't wait till tomorrow. If God is really your God and Jesus is really your Savior and Lord, commit to getting to know Him better today by reading the very book that teaches you all that you are to believe concerning God and all that God requires of you. You do that and you'll be on the path of success, which is the path of faithfulness displayed in obedience. Because knowing the scripture should always lead to doing the scriptures. Otherwise, we're no, no different than the demons, who seem to know the scriptures very well, but yet they don't obey God in practicing the scriptures. We learn what we are to believe and to do in the Bible, and then we do it. Just knowing what, a lot about the Bible is not the same as being obedient, right? The, the, the demons know that. So we must ask ourselves, are we living lives that are obedient to what we know the Bible teaches? This is something, uh, the, the, this is something of all of us must ask ourselves because we possess inherently an amazing capacity to do otherwise. Honesty in this area is very important because we tend to compartmentalize our lives. Like we find an area of obedience. Oh, I'm really obedient on this area here. And then we try to generalize as making that a reality of our whole lives. We often hide behind the it's complicated in, in order to keep us from obeying. But the fact is that, that God's word is generally and painfully clear. Mark Twain once said, it is not what I don't understand about the Bible that bothers me, it's what I do understand. And don't hide behind it's complicated because you just don't want to do what the Bible says. Because it's not complicated. God is clear in what He wants His people to do. So success comes when we faithfully study God's Word and faithfully obey it by applying what we understand to all areas of our lives under the direction of the Holy Spirit. And I don't know if you know that, if you realize that, if you thought about that, obedience is what we were designed to do by God. In the original creation, man was designed to obey God. Then we fell. But then we're recreated in Jesus Christ. And that's why Paul says, so we continue sinning that grace may abound. It says no. To use a a, 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 a limonism, no a thousand times no. We're not to continue to sin because we have been born again to newness of life. That's what we're designed to do in Jesus Christ. Remember Ephesians two two ten, no eight and nine says that we've been. Saved by grace through faith, and that's not our own. That's which we boast a gift from God. 
But then 10 says that we are in that process because we have been recreated. We're God's workmanship created unto good works prepared for us by Jesus Christ ahead of time. So that's where we're designed to obey. That's what that's where we're at our best. Uh, my son has a dog, and a few times I've taken him to the dog part at Point Defiance. The dog's name the dog's name is Running Bear. And at the park, he gets to be off the leash and run free. He plays with other god dogs, he herds them, he jumps, he rolls. He seems to be in dog heaven at the park because he's doing exactly what God designed him to be in his dogness. He's fulfilling his design there. So, brothers, never are we greater. Never do we know greater joy. Never are we more successful than when we are obedient to God's word because that's what we were designed to do. And the exciting thing is that such glory, such joy, such success is not just within the grasp of a few selected, uh, selected few Christians. It is in the reach of all, regardless of our situation. If you've been redeemed by Jesus Christ, this joy, this success is in your hands. And as we close, this, this, I told you that I wanted to talk about faithfulness in terms of obedience, and then also in terms of hard work. Briefly on the hard work side, <clears throat> brothers, the Bible teaches that there's no such thing as a lazy, faithful servant. That does not we know them. They exist. I, I'm not saying that in real life they don't have lazy Christians, but as a category, the Bible says doesn't have that category. It's a dangerous place to be as a lazy Christian. You cannot be lazy and faithful. I think the parable of the talents tells us, and we all know that by heart, right? You have the, the first guy is given five talents, and he works hard and gets five more. Another guy is given two talents. He works hard and tr transforms that into four talents. And remember what? The Lord says to both of them, Well done, my good and faithful servant. Now, there's a guy that's given one talent. He does nothing. He buries it and returns the same talent to the Lord. Do you know how God calls that one? Not faithful, not good, but you wicked and lazy servant. He did nothing with what God had given them, given him. Just buried it and waited for him to come back. He's not faithful. <laughs> he is lazy. Now, Jesus himself modeled the energy that the, he expects from his faithful servants. One day, while weary from his ministry and travel, Jesus stopped by a well in Samaria for some much needed rest. As he's sitting there, he heard the footsteps of a woman coming toward him. He could have not lifted his eyes and kept to himself. He could have just got his phone, and, right, and just not uh, uh, pay attention to her or whatever it is, a little scroll of the, the, the law. And, uh, but he didn't. In his weariness, what did he do? He engaged her. In his weariness, he engaged her in, in one of the most beautiful displays of gracious aggression in the Bible. He went for her soul. That's our pattern. The Bible doesn't call us to an obsessive, compulsive workaholism, but it does call us to work hard if we're going to be faithful. The Bible recognizes our limitations and needs, but the fact remains that a faithful servant will be hardworking and, when necessary, will labor to exhaustion. It doesn't have to be your whole life, or even every day or every week, but when God calls you to do that, if you're going to be faithful, you need to be willing to do that. Paul describes himself of that in 2 Corinthians 11, verses 27, 28. He says, In toil and hardship, through many a sleepless night, in hunger and thirst, often without food, and cold and exposure. That's how he describes the way that he worked to the Lord. This, this, this is very much in opposition to the current belief that blessings plus success equals comfort. The more you're faithful, the less comfortable you're going to be in this world. So faithfulness is one of the essential metrics used to measure success. The beauty of it is that when defined this way, success is equally possible for Christians in all situations. So, delve deep into God's Word. 
read it and reread it. Meditate on it. Let it dwell richly within you. Then as it speaks to you, faithfully obey it with all your might and keep on working hard for God. That's success because success is defined as faithfulness. Let us pray. Thank you.